Well, George Bernard Shaw once said, Some men see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. That's a quote that has probably been in my mind ever since I was a kid. Actually, a quote made famous by the Kennedys back in the 60s. But it's also the quote that the first quote and the first thought that entered my, my mind as I was reading chapter 5 of Dare to Dream as we continue the study of Mike Slaughter's book this week. I dream things that never were and say, why not? I'm going to come back to that quote a little bit later on in my sermon. So Slaughter, in chapter 5, continues, as we just heard, uh, the story of Moses. So far in the last uh, three weeks, we have heard Moses uh, coming to God at the burning bush. We heard Moses being called by God to lead the Israelites out of their oppression in Egypt. Last week, Moses gave a few excuses as to why he felt like he was unqualified and ill-equipped to be a spokesperson for God. And as we just heard today, Moses is still a little unsure of himself, and so God helps him along. And Slaughter in this chapter suggests that Moses' story has something to teach us about our own story. What is that in your hand? God asked Moses, and Moses replies, a staff. Throw it down on the ground, God says. I want to stop there and just consider what must have been going through Moses' mind at that moment. As a shepherd, and that's what Moses was then and had been for a good while, a staff would have been an absolute necessity for his life. He would have needed it for, for so many reasons. He would have used a staff to keep his sheep safe, uh, to keep them from going astray, to keep them in line. He would have used that staff to, to wield off uh, any predators, not just to keep his sheep safe, but to keep himself safe from wolves and whatever else may have been around. He would have used that staff uh, as a walking stick whenever he came to rough terrain. A staff would have been indispensable, really, for, for Moses, for his livelihood, for his life. And because of that, it would have been important even just for his family's livelihood. Moses had been tending the flock of Jethro for years. The Bible suggests maybe even as long as 40 years. That's what he'd been doing for most of his adult life. And so this staff was essentially an extension of his arm. It was like a part of him by that point. So when God says, throw it down, throw it on the ground, Moses must have felt like he was losing a part of himself that he was throwing away something that brought him security, brought him comfort. But he did. Of course, the Bible doesn't really go into any detail about what Moses was thinking. We don't know that. The Bible doesn't say it. It just says Moses threw the staff on the ground. But we know. You read in between the lines. You know what Moses was thinking. He had to be struggling with this. And as I read and contemplate this part of Moses' story, I can't help but ask myself the question, is there anything in my life that I would struggle to let go of? Something that brings me comfort and security that I, that I just can't let my grip, let go of that grip? That's a question we all need to ask ourselves. Because we see what happens once Moses releases his grip. And once he throws the staff on the ground and turns it over to God. We see what happens in God's hand. It is no longer just a staff. It's not just a stick. This ordinary object now has extraordinary power. 
In the future, this staff will no longer just be something that's used to, to steer sheep. It, it will soon be the same instrument that's used to part a sea. It'll be an instrument that's used to prophesy to Pharaoh. It'll be the same instrument that's used to bring forth water from a rock. It'll be used to help lead an oppressed people to freedom. It's always inspirational to read stories like this and to hear God doing amazing things in history. But I have to be honest, I have to confess that when I hear stories like Moses' staff turning into a snake or God transforming Moses' life around like that, I, I sometimes ask, but what does that have to do with me? or with us thousands of years later. Now, I don't anticipate that God is going to be calling me to, to lead a multitude of people to freedom. I don't really believe that God is going to transform my iPhone into a reptile, as cool as that would be. Wouldn't it be? <laughs> but then people like Mike Slaughter come along and they help us see that we probably have more in common with Moses than, than we think. And that in order for us to discover God's purpose for our life, there is a necessary throwing down of our gifts, so to speak, in order for God to take them back up and to transform them into a greater purpose. We saw that specifically in the chapter of his book this week, I think, in, in this wonderful illustration about this gentleman who, who loves cars. His pastime was, was cars. In fact, that was his real passion. He knew all about cars, everything about cars. He loved working on them. Car repair was essentially this man's staff that he threw down on the ground before God, and then God took, took that back up, and he transformed this man's hobby, his pastime, into this ministry, a ministry that repaired and, and gave away over 1,000. It was like 1,200 cars to people who needed them. That's what can happen when we release our gifts and our life experiences and our interests and our passions to God. God can take them and God can do something with them that we never could have imagined or seen that we could do with them on our own. You know, and stories like this are not just things that happen far away in other places and other states and other countries or in books. They, they're happening right here in our own community. They're happening in our church. I remember before I became a pastor here at, at DUMC, I've lived in this area for a long time, I, I used to see bumper stickers on cars that said bags of hope. I would see those all, all the time. I didn't really know exactly what bags of hope was. So I was excited when I became a pastor here to learn that, that DUMC was instrumental in the, the birth of, of this ministry, Bags of Hope. Our own church member here, Ashley Nidish, who many of you know, took her passion and her love and her care for children along with a certain skill that she had, a skill for puzzles, tangram puzzles in particular. She took these skills and these gifts and these passions and she, she threw them down before God. And she, along with a few other people, she wanted to make sure that I said that, that it wasn't just her. She, along with a few other people, helped to found Bags of Hope. And God transformed this, this small and modest, wonderful, but, but modest backpack ministry that helped feed about 80 children on the weekends into this community-wide nonprofit 
that now works with 27 different schools and helps to feed up to 700 children who are living with food insecurity. Ashley, when I talked to her this week, told me, very modest, extremely modest person, Ashley told me that one of the things that she has been able to do her entire life was puzzles. She could work puzzles very, really well. She has a spatial ability. She can put things together well. And she says she uses those gifts every day with bags of hope, figuring out the, the best and the most efficient ways to fit the most amount possible of food into those backpacks. She fits them in like puzzle pieces for those kids when they take home those backpacks on the weekends for food. For her, it's like a puzzle. She gave that gift to God. As unusual of a gift as that may sound, and God uses it in spades for God's kingdom. And of course, the thing is, is that neither Ashley nor, nor that man who runs the car ministry, or even Moses, could have seen what their ministries would eventually look like. First, they had to let go of their gifts. They had to throw them down, as God told Moses. And they had to trust, trust and let God transform them into more than what they could have been on their own. And when God gave it back, their gifts were more valuable. They were more important. They were just better than they were before. I mean, herding sheep is good. What Moses was doing beforehand was fine. It was good. But freeing an, a, an oppressed nation of people, that's better. Repairing cars is good. But repairing and giving 1,200 cars away to people in need is better. Feeding 80 kids is, is wonderful. But feeding 700 hungry children, that's way better. And these are just three examples of, of ordinary people giving their gifts and their passions, their interest to God, and then God making something extraordinary from it. You may have a ministry inside of you that's just waiting to get out. In fact, I, I'm, I feel sure you do. I would suggest, and I feel sure that Mike Slaughter would agree, that you not wait on the church, that you not wait on the staff or the pastors of the church to tell you what all of the ministries of the church will be. You tell us. That is one of the dangers of being at a big church like DUMC is that we have a lot of staff, we have a lot of clergy, and uh, you know, sometimes we can make the mistake of letting the, the paid people do the ministry. When the truth is, everyone is gifted. We're all gifted. Each one of us has a staff to throw down before God. All right, I want to go back to that quote that I mentioned from George Bernard Shaw. He said again, Some people see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. Frankly, I think Slaughter should have used that quote in his book, in this chapter. It would have been better. I haven't read chapter 6 yet, so maybe it's in there. <laughs> Whether it's there or not. This really is the purpose for all of, of God's people. To dream things that haven't happened yet, and to say, why not make them happen? And the way we make them happen is by releasing our gifts to God, throwing down our staff. That's when God's dream for our life will begin to come into focus. Amen.